Well, good afternoon, everybody. I am Devin Walsh along with Asher Red. We want to welcome all of you to our podcast today that we're calling Death Row Confidential. As you know, uh, we have reported that Alabama executed its fifth inmate this year, Derek Dearman, a case that uh, happened here along the Gulf Coast. And Asher was our reporter from WKRG chosen to cover this execution. And a lot has gone into this. I know you had started preparing for this, uh, for this um, execution and all the information that you had to learn a long time ago. Yeah, so for those at home who don't know, we come into work, we pitch a story, we turn it by the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, when you start doing these, what some would call investigative stories or these, or these special projects, uh, it could take days, weeks, and in this case, it took me about a month and a half to get this done. Um, there were a lot of files, a lot of documents, mm -hmm. a lot of people to talk to. People who weren't even in the story, I ended up talking to them you know, at some point along the way just to, get, just to pick their brains a little bit reaching out to people as well. Uh, so this one really took quite a few months, uh, or, I, or I should say a month and a half really, to get this uh, to get this ball rolling. And as we know, Derek Dearman was executed uh, yesterday uh, at about 6.14 was his time of death. Okay, so this is an opportunity for you uh, to kind of hear the behind the scenes. We've gotten a lot of questions here at WKRG and Asher has received a lot of questions about how the process works. So Asher, you you actually tried to talk to Derek Dearman to try to get um, an interview with him. He turned that down, but he did issue a statement through his spiritual advisor and basically just apologizing for, for what happened. Yeah, so in early September, I sent Derek a letter. Um, I sent it to the, to, to the prison, to Holman uh, Correctional Facility. And about a week later, I got a phone call and I didn't know why Holman Correctional Facility was calling mm -hmm. me. Uh, and turns out it was Derek Dearman. Uh, he said, you know, I wanna make sure that we talk about what I wanna talk about. He wanted it to focus not on the crime, but he told me he wanted it to focus on the victim's families. Uh, and I told him, I said, if you wanna talk about that, mm -hmm. you have the floor. Right. I will let you talk about whatever you wanna talk about. Um, this is just your opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and he never called me back after that. I was gonna say, so then what happened? So yeah. you never heard from him again? He never called me back. Um, I didn't hear from him again. I got in touch with his spiritual advisor, uh, Reverend Jeff Hood, uh, who works with people all across the country. Okay. He uh, is a spiritual advisor for many, many death row inmates. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, I talked to him, I said, do you think you could convince Derek to at least give me a statement um, before he heads to that execution chamber? Because mm -hmm. we want him to at least have some sort of a say in the story. It's our journalistic due diligence. Mm -hmm. um, and he talked him into it. So we got I got a voice recording in my text messages 30 minutes later. I okay. said, hey, this is, you know, I'm sorry. This is what I what I want this to be about. And that was okay. the recording that we played yesterday. You know, it was just such a, a devastating crime. I remember it back in 2016. Uh, he killed five people and an unborn baby at a, in a small house in the woods at Citronelle. I mean, mad over... Uh, something that his girlfriend had done and you were reminding us of some of the things that happened that he had been to this house This was his girlfriend's brother's house. They had told him not to come back and he shows up in the middle of the night finds an axe outside uh, Murders everybody with the axe takes a gun From someone in the house and then makes sure they're dead and, and shoots them all again. Is that correct? Yep, it is a extremely gruesome case um, mm -hmm. A lot of the people I've spoken with, they said this is one of the most gruesome thing they th things that they've seen. I know in trial they showed some pictures to the jury. Um, people that I spoke with who were in the courtroom say that it still somewhat haunts them, those images do. I'm sure. Um, yeah, but like, back to your point where you said that he was mad at something his girlfriend did. Derek Dearman was, um, he was on meth at the time of yes. this. And uh, he and his girlfriend, Lynetta Lester, had a very volatile relationship. Mm -hmm. It's really important to know that because a lot of times when you're in a volatile relationship, you try to get out uh, or away from that person. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Lynetta Lester ended up going to her brother's house to get away from uh, Derek Dearman. That house that she went to is a small 900 square foot house on Jim Platt Road right. in and, Cidronelle. Yeah. And you said you actually went back to that house and it, it had burned down? Yeah, it was burned down less than a month after the crime. Uh, neighbors say that the house, for some reason, became a tourist destination. People would go wanting to take pictures, people would want to go see the crime scene, and then it burns down. 
And so when we went out there a few days ago, we couldn't find it. It was overgrown. Mm -hmm. It was just, you couldn't find it. It was leveled completely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, at, at, when he was arrested, he was not denying that he did this. I remember when the cops, uh, sheriff's department walked him out of the sheriff's department, he said he was sorry. I mean, he never denied that he did it. Um, flaming meth, I, I just, you just can't imagine how much of a rage he was in to do something like this. Yeah, and his spiritual advisor, uh, Reverend Jeff Hood, uh, told me, he said, you know, at the time, De Dearman waived all of his appeals. That way he could, uh, he waived all of his appeals. That way he could, you know, go through the process as quick as possible. Okay. That was the big thing that got him uh, just six years on death row. Uh, now, if we go even further into that, uh, the, the Reverend told me that uh, at the time, the beginning of this, uh, Dearman was unbelievably hopeless. Okay. Towards the end of his time on death row, he said, the, the Reverend said that Dearman was hopeful that he would get to heaven. And well, that's wow. where I asked that wow. question yesterday in that story, does a murderer really go to heaven? And that's, that's up for right, debate. Right, right. And I guess they always say if you're going to find Jesus, they always find it on death row. I mean, it's, you know, I, if you've ever um, gone to a prison or jail, it, it is amazing how religious the inmates become when they're in there. But I guess if, if that's the time to find hope, maybe that's a good time, I guess. Yeah. Uh, okay, so he was on death row, and he was, when you think about death row, you think about people in, obviously, in isolation. So he was in a cell by himself. There wasn't a social area like there is in, at Metro Jail where you have maybe four people in a cell and they have kind of a social area. He didn't have socialization, is that correct? Yeah, so he was what we would call a single walk uh, inmate. Mm -hmm. A single walk inmate is one of the most restricted inmates on death row. You've got the single walk and you've got, um, I can't remember the other term that they use, um, but basically when he goes out of his cell, he has to be by himself. Okay. And he's by himself all the time. Um, and then, of course, those last, I would say, maybe 40, 48 hours of his life, they move him to another cell. And from what I'm told, that door, if you're looking, I mean, you might not be able to see it at home, but from me to, like, that wall uh -huh. is about where that execution chamber door is. Oh, so he's so staring he has, at that oh, door the okay. whole time. Oh, gosh. And, okay. um, and he's, of course, the last 48 hours or so, he's by himself unless he has family and spiritual advisor come and visit him. Right. So he had quite a few visitors the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. I know you sent an email of exactly um, who came, and then he was able to have some phone calls. Mm -hmm. uh, so share with the audience exactly right who here. came to visit. Yeah, I've got him right here. I knew, I knew this was going to be asked. Uh, all right. So when, when we get these emails, um, we get a, we, I get an email from the Department of Corrections that says it's literally inmates activities over the last 24 hours. So it starts on October the 16th, okay. which was uh, Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wednesday. And um, so he had three visitors, Gary Dearman, his father, Abigail Thomas, his sister, and of course, Jeff Hood, his spiritual advisor. Okay. Um, he's also allowed to make phone calls. So he called Abigail Thomas, who did visit him. Uh, that was his sister. Mm -hmm. Rusty Hobby, which is a friend. Veronica uh, Jernigan, which is a friend. Jeff Hood, spiritual advisor, and of course his dad, Gary, Gary Dearman. His final day, um, he had more visitors. Uh, Veronica Jernigan, Gary Dearman, Hayden Dearman, which is his son, and Braxton Dearman, which is also his son. I'm told by the spiritual advisor that, and this is what the spiritual advisor tells me mm -hmm. at least, um, the, his two sons, he hadn't spoken with in 15 years. Oh, wow. And he, at one point, Dearman thought of maybe I should have my sons in the execution chamber, Ugh. and uh, that was a decision he had to make, or he had to make. Looking back on it now, that spiritual advisor was not allowed in the execution chamber because Dearman, at the very last minute, requested that he not be there. And we played a soundbite yesterday. Uh, Dearman apparently told the prison guard that he is quote Jesus Christ and doesn't need a spiritual. Advisor. I mean, it's just crazy considering how remorseful he had been this whole time. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, oh, I don't, I don't need you, spiritual advisor. I'm Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, yes. and that's just a whole other conversation because one of the things, and correct me if I word this wrong, Jeff Hood told you, the spiritual advisor, he's been doing drugs in prison. Absolutely. And that's so what he's been saying. he would go visit him, eyes glazed over, describe what Hood 
saw him looking like when he was high on drugs. So maybe he was high on drugs when he thought he was Jesus Christ. I don't know. Yeah, well, um, yeah, well uh, I mean, as early, the spiritual advisor knows that as soon as the day before his execution, he knows that he was high on drugs. Uh, he says that Deerman would be very um, kind of rude sometimes. He would get unpredictable. He would start yelling, those sorts of things while he was okay. uh, on drugs. Now, uh, it is worth knowing that in the execution chamber, you know, the poor reporters who were there, who were in the chamber, say that they saw Deerman's eyes were, like you said, kind of glossy, glassed over, mm -hmm. maybe a little cloudy. Um, really raised some questions. Was he high at the time of execution? Mm -hmm. I did ask the Department of Corrections, uh, which this story is airing today. This is mm -hmm. what I've been working on all day. I asked the Department of Corrections um, twice in an email and once in person, do you think that possible drug use that late in the game would, um, I guess you could say, botch this lethal injection? Would it make it more lethal? Those are the things that, mm -hmm. that I wanted to, uh, I wanted to know. And they haven't responded to either of my two emails, but mm -hmm. when I asked them in person, they had, of course, no other um, option but to answer, I would say. Right, <laughs> right. So, um, all right, so let's let's back up a little bit. So you covered this execution for WKRG, but the way it works with the Alabama Department of Corrections is that people who are, want to cover an execution, and there are witnesses, it's, a, it's an important part of the process, you apply to be a part of the media pool. So you were not, basically they pulled some names out of a hat, you were not chosen. So you were put with another group of reporters in a different area of the prison. Was it actually the same building where Holman is or is it off site? We were about a mile down the road. So if you know anything about Atmore, uh, you drive, say you're getting off the interstate, mm -hmm. drive towards Holman, mm -hmm. um, and then about a mile past the Holman entrance, you're gonna see this small white building and that's the media center. Um, it's a small room, some outlets in there just for us to charge all of our stuff and mm -hmm. then they do the press conference there afterwards. Okay. So to your point of how they select this, um, it's five people, limited okay. to five five media witnesses. You've got one reporter from the Associated Press, mm -hmm. that's just the, uh, the just always a thing. You've mm -hmm. got two print reporters and two broadcast and online reporters, like digital reporters such. So um, all those people were in, they take them about I think they left at about five o'clock. Okay. They get screened and checked for anything they might have on mm -hmm. them before they get on the bus. And then when they get to the prison, they're screened and checked again through a metal detector. And then they go in, curtains open, final words, uh, execution, curtains closed, time of death. Wow. That's okay. simple. Yeah, and that so quick. then that group of reporters comes back mm -hmm. a mile away to where you guys are waiting yep. and, and, have, and kind of explain. Yeah. Their job is basically to when that door opens and they come in, they yell out all the information to everyone. And so they yell it out, we're typing everything up mm -hmm. and we're writing our stories. The media center then does, the, the, the commissioner of the Alabama Department of Corrections then does a press conference. Mm -hmm. An hour after that press conference is done, um, the media center closes. And that gives us enough time to write whatever stories we need to, pack up whatever equipment we need to. In this particular case, we left immediately after that press conference because mm -hmm. the spiritual advisor had his own press conference um, back, uh, you know, a few miles down the road where he okay, was okay. Um, to talk about the drug abuse. Okay, so uh, the victims' families, we had not heard from them. I mean, I just can't even imagine how this was for them to just, I know it was you know, several years ago, but just reliving all those horrible moments. But they actually said some things as well. And I was struck by uh, one of the relatives who said that he forgave him. Um, he said, you know, I forgive Derek. What else, what other choice do I have but to forgive him? And I'm thinking to myself, how in the world could you forgive someone for doing that to your loved one? But um, that, that really struck me that there were several family members afterwards who did want to talk. Yeah, there was uh, one, one family member uh, left a statement for mm -hmm. the Department of Corrections um, uh, commissioner. Okay. Uh, John John Ham, John Q Ham, I should say, uh, to read out loud, and then following that, uh, a family member named Robert Brown. Mm -hmm. He lost six family members mm -hmm. in that crime, um, and he he recalled getting the getting the news. He was at a gas station. He got the news. Mm -hmm. um, his wife's when you pull over, um, you know you're not going to believe what just happened. Right. And he said that his wife just said, "Everyone's gone." And he just broke down. He said something, the, the police officers who were there just like stopped him from doing anything he shouldn't have done that night. 
Um, and then he came in front of the microphones yesterday and he said all he has for Derek Nearman is pity because mm-hmm. Derek Nearman wanted he asked for forgiveness from the family and he just he said I, all I can do is pity him right right yeah. I mean you know what do you what do you say and you, you know people always ask well do you have closure it doesn't sound like when I was listening he has no closure I mean, relative how could you six of your family members it was just so senseless yeah. One of the quotes that got to me the hardest, and as reporters, <clears throat> I know we always were on TV and whatnot, and it, but it's we do have feelings and we do feel emotions. Mm-hmm. And I felt something when he said, "Dearman's family got to say goodbye to him. I didn't get to say goodbye to my six mm-hmm. family members." And that was mm-hmm. that was what got me. And the reason I say six family members, we've been saying five people. I say six because he said six in the press conference. Right. He was talking about an unborn child. Right. There was a pregnant right. woman who was killed in this. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's kind of what um, that's kind of what, uh, what where everything started from. Mm-hmm. So and went to. Mm-hmm. So uh, w- as far as who was allowed to be in the execution chamber, uh, you said five media members, and then Dearman was able to pick. How many people was he mm-hmm. able to pick? I can choose. So right. who exactly look. was in there? Can't imagine uh, how long. Uh, let's see here. Give me just a moment. I always, yeah, I, I I always keep this up. All right, so um, we had five witnesses. Abigail Thomas, which I said earlier was his sister. Gary Dearman, his father. Abigail Brooks, a friend. Ronzi uh, Thomas and Veronica Jernigan, all those uh, friends. Okay, so you, his father was not in there. Father wasn't oh, there. wasn't there. So Dearman, sister, yeah. father. Five people. And then and the rest were friends. friends. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was... Uh, you know, he gets his opportunity to pick people. The family, the victim's family gets to be there if mm-hmm. they would like to be mm-hmm. there. And then, of course, the media. Okay. And so, uh, Asher, I know that a lot of people may not realize this about you, but you actually um, double majored or minored in criminal mm-hmm. justice when you were in college. Mm-hmm. So, at the University of Alabama. And uh, so, you're familiar with the criminal process. Mm-hmm. And you were chosen by WKRG to cover this execution. Mm-hmm. How did you feel about it? going in. I mean, that's a hard thing to know that you could witness her in execution or even yesterday being there, you didn't witness it, but mm-hmm. it was, it was raw, eerie. it was emotional, it was yeah. eerie. What was that like? Um, hmm. I will say the night, so I, I, we were pulled in the news director's office and we were starting to talk about some things, just kind of seeing if we wanted to do this or not. And we said, we decided, yes, we have to. Mm-hmm. Um, I did take that night to really talk some things over. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, going over in my head, do I really want to see this? Do I, do I want to expose myself to this? Right, because you didn't and know at that point if you'd been chosen. I didn't know at that point I'd mm-hmm. been cho- if, if I'd been chosen or not. And uh, it, it was a little nerve-wracking at first mm-hmm. um, because you got to think, there's this guy who I've spoken with on the phone. I've sent a letter to. Mm-hmm. This guy I've spoken with is going to be dead in the next month or so. Mm-hmm. So that's what was going through my head. And um, we ended up, um, you know, I ended up coming to the conclusion that I think I'd be fine with it. As you said, the minor in criminal justice, um, you know, this these types of stories, I don't want to say are right up my alley, mm-hmm. but there um, there's definitely is a certain understanding that has to be had with some with, with cases like this. Right, where where a lot of people feel that justice was served mm-hmm. for. Um, and then there's there's a fine line: what's justice and what's you know just a continuing problem. And the continuing mm-hmm. problem here that we've seen, as we talked about earlier, was drug abuse. It goes back to that, to yeah. meth. I mean, the meth is such a big problem. And I, I just, uh, you think to yourself, well, how did he get drugs in the, in the prison? But we know they're there. Uh-huh. We've had inmates tell us that. We, yeah. But we, um, actually, was the story I'm working on today is about Alabama uh, Department of Corrections and their, what I called in the story, a toxic relationship with contraband. Mm-hmm. Contraband is snuck into prisons in different ways. The National Institute of Justice um, it goes through a number of reasons. First and foremost, contraband is not just drugs. It's also phones, mm-hmm. uh, certain, I guess you could say, maybe certain books or magazines or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, but the, Depart- the, the National Institute of Justice does say that obviously contraband is brought in by, it could be employees, mm-hmm. it could be civilians, mm-hmm. and as believe it or not, drones. Drones. That and was just a massive. Things. That was a massive part of that, uh, of that thing that, that that I was reading through earlier, and some of the reports that I saw, they are just flying over. Wow, and, and just dropping 
Wow. And that, I mean, it's, it's, such, it's such a major problem. Mm -hmm. and, and the spiritual advisor, did he ever talk directly to Derek Dearman? And Derek Dearman said, yeah, I've got access to drugs here. Yep. That's uh, one of the things he says. Uh, Dearman would, I guess, I guess you could say he would boast okay. to the spiritual advisor of the drugs that he had that day, the drugs that he was able to get a hold of, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, a, lot of these, um, a lot of these death row inmates, especially at Holman, uh -huh. the spiritual advisor says they're laid out. They're laid out high as a kite getting these drugs. And it's so crazy that you can think one of the most restricted inmates can get a hold of that. Right. I mean, you said, yeah, no socialization. Mm -hmm. He's by himself in a cell. Uh, and you know what's important to know is when you see, uh, <clears throat> when you see the, the Holman, for example, mm -hmm. and, and and you hear about a drug issue, we have to ask that question to the Department of Corrections. Like I said earlier, I've I, I asked them twice over email; they didn't respond. Um, and then I asked the commissioner when I saw him yesterday in person with the cameras rolling. I said, "Is this a problem?" Mm -hmm. He said he didn't deny that yes, drug or he didn't deny that drugs were not a problem. Right. He said that yeah, it's a problem, and we've been they've arrested multiple employees in the past mm -hmm. few years, and a hundred over 155 civilians at this point. Wow. The, just this mm -hmm. year. Just alone. just this year. Yeah. Smuggling it in. Uh, okay, so if you're just joining us, we are talking about the execution of Derek Dearman that happened last night. He was put to death by lethal injection in Atmore at 614. Mm -hmm. So we knew, um, Asher, that this execution could take place anytime after midnight, mm -hmm. but we thought it would be around 6 o'clock. Uh, how long did it actually take for him to die? So the curtains opened at 553. Um, and so, you know, what happens is he's, he's, he walks into the chamber, curtains open, uh, he says his final words, and then what they, did he say? Um, that I would have to look up. Uh, he did say he Apolo did talk he about apologized. The, he apologized. Yeah. He said, you know, the family, um, you know, this isn't for you. This is for me, or this isn't this isn't for me. This is for you. Yes, yes. And then he, I got it backwards. There. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then he said to my family, y'all already know I love you, and that was mm -hmm. his final words. The microphone's cut off, and the spiritual advisor tells me that just about every single time after the microphone's cut off, they always end up saying something else. They always, and, but the spiritual advisor wasn't in, in the, the execution too. chamber to really give us his actual last words. Right. He was given a stick. Um, he was stuck in both arms, and then the fatal cocktail went in. And he was, curtains closed at around 6.08, I believe, okay. and pronounced dead by a doctor at 6.14. So the curtain closes before he's actually dead? Because mm -hmm. so they have to bring a doctor in to check, yeah. to make sure his vitals and everything. And they will do a, conscious, uh, a consciousness check in there mm -hmm. and you're in the consciousness checked his arms moved a little bit both arms uh moved and at first you know they were thinking was this a sign of consciousness and mm -hmm. then the uh the commissioner when we were spe speaking with him afterwards he said it was not a sign of consciousness but i did see what you're talking about uh, okay so they okay. will do those checks and everything that way they know when to close the curtain i guess mm -hmm. you could say so mm. did he choose his method of execution he was given the, the opportunity to choose between, from what I understand, he was given the, the opportunity to choose between nitrogen hypoxia, mm -hmm. as we all know, that's been in the news a lot mm -hmm. lately, and he was also able to choose between lethal injection. And, I think, lethal injection. and I think the next execution that's happening in the next mm -hmm. five weeks, is that when it is? Yeah, November the 31st. Um, that inmate has chosen mm -hmm. nitrogen hypoxia, I believe. Not 100% sure. Not 100% sure. Yeah, not but on that. He, um, I, I actually, just before we came in here, um, wrote a letter to send to him. As well. I mean, it's, it, and so what are you, why did you, why did you want to interview Derek Dearman? Because that's, that is true journalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the, I mean, you can't just, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to tell this guy's story from, you know, him being on death row and mm -hmm. his execution without giving him a fair shake. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever you think, whether you believe with the person or, or, or you don't or you think what he did was good or not, you still have to give this person a fair opportunity because at the end of the day, just like you and me, we exist. Mm -hmm. We're human. So we have to give him some sort of an opportunity. And if you don't give him an opportunity to speak, it's not a real story. Mm -hmm. Like, sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, you, yeah, you gave him the opportunity, yeah. and I didn't realize that you had talked to him on the phone. And mm -hmm. and I wonder what happened between the time that, you know, he said, hey, you can, yeah, I'll talk to you. You just got to, we want to talk about these things. And then all of a sudden, you didn't really hear from him. So mm -hmm. I don't know what changed. Yeah, and he, he did say that, you know, when I, when I spoke with him on the phone, he said, this is um, not me saying I'm going to do it. It's not me saying I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm just... 
I'm thinking about it, and I'll let you know. You never let me know. So Jeff Hood, uh, the spiritual advisor, we have heard from him before. We often um, hear from him. He is, is he the spiritual advisor for everybody on death row? Mm -hmm. if, well, not they everybody. Choose? They, they can choose him. And so okay. you may remember Kenny Smith, who was killed um, or executed, I should say, uh, earlier this year. Okay. It was National Hypoxia. That was mm -hmm. his spiritual advisor. Okay. He's got, he, so Jeff Hood lives in Arkansas, but he works with people all over the country. Okay. Uh, he, and he says by far Derek Dearman has the most bodies on his conscience than anyone else mm. that he's ever worked with. Five right. people, including a pregnant woman. And he's also, um, his words says he was one of the most difficult people he's ever worked with. Really? What was difficult about him? Uh, the drug use. Mm -hmm. It all, like, like we said earlier, right. it all ties back to the drug use. So sometimes he would be as normal as a murderer can be, and then other times he's just totally bizarre, and he never mm -hmm. knew which one he would get. Is that what it was? Yeah. Uh, you know, Dearman was known, uh, according to Hood at least, was known to um, kind of have these random spurts of anger and a lot of it was fueled by the drugs that he was mm -hmm. getting in prison um and when we asked the commissioner um if dearman had taken drugs the day of his execution he said he had no clue mm -hmm. uh he said he doesn't think so because the uh he, he was around family and he was closely mm -hmm. monitored huh. but the day before that you know the the, the, right. the the reverend tells me that he was literally the high as a kite when he went mm -hmm. in so oh my gosh yeah and so how does the reverend feel about capital punishment? I'm just curious. Did he ever, did he ever make comments to you about, or that's not really his place maybe to, it's, it is it is um, in place in the state of Alabama. Does he have any? He works the best he can with what he has. Like, you know, in life you have to, you know, deal the best hand you have with, mm -hmm. with the cards you're given. And so right. he's, he's a reverend and he... Um, he does, uh, in my s talks with him, mm -hmm. he does seem to oppose the death penalty mm -hmm. and the capital punishment. Um, you know, he's he said some pretty uh, s some pretty out there quotes um, that really kind of drove that point home. Uh, but he did he did understand that this is what the state of Alabama decided. Mm -hmm. They probably didn't know that they were going to send Derek Dearman to a facility that he was going to be allegedly on drugs on, mm -hmm. or drugs the whole six years he was there. So he didn't have his opinions, but he, like I said, was trying to make do with what he had. Okay. So here, you know, here, how have you been, what has your day been like today? I mean, or last night when you got home, I imagine you just, you seem like you've been kind of quiet today. Uh, it, it seems like it impacted you in some way. I mean, anytime you mm -hmm. cover a heavy story like this, we feel like it is our responsibility to bring the information to you. But it's, you know, it's upsetting. I mean, even reading yesterday, I was reading the notes you sent in about the final meals, and he had this for dinner and this for the seafood restaurant for a, a seafood plate from a local restaurant. It just, it was so morbid. Uh, how are you feeling about everything today, as far as being so close to where this took place? Yeah, well, like I said earlier, just because I'm, just because we're journalists and just because we're on TV and you know, all that does not mean we don't have feelings. Mm -hmm. it does not mean that we don't feel emotions. Um, you know, whether whether we agree with capital punishment or not, it still does weigh down on you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, although I wasn't in the witness chamber, it's one of those things where I could look, I, I could walk out the door of the media center and look and see the top of Holman, and mm -hmm. I'm just thinking, I, I, I remember the time of death. Um, you know, we had just wrapped up a six o'clock mm -hmm. live shot, mm -hmm. and I remember the time of death um, w when they came back and told us later. I was thinking, what was I doing at that time? Um, I was tearing down a camera, mm -hmm. and I was looking at Holman at around that mm -hmm. time, because you never know what's really going on right. unless you're in the chamber. Right. And so it's um, it's one of those things. I've worked on this story for a month and a half or so, and now the story I don't want to say has come to an end, but it quite literally has. Right. Right, and now the families, you just feel for these families. This, this chapter has closed, but... Uh, this, is, this is the only story I've done where it's actually closed. Yeah. And that's because it's, someone's executed. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. All the other stories I've ever done with Ebi Karaji, mm -hmm. or even, even back when I was in Tuscaloosa, um, they're still wide open stories. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be that follow-up story to do. This one, I don't know if there's any follow-up to it. Right, right. What else have have you been thinking about or that you needed to add that I have not asked you about today as far as details about what happened yesterday? I can look through. What else? Sure. Uh, 
So one of the things that um, is is probably pretty important to know is that you know when these uh, when these executions are carried out, you know it, it is a process. Mm -hmm. It's a lengthy process, right. and because the executions happen in our viewing area, we have to cover them. Right, and. Uh, of course, there will be media from places where the ex where, where the crime mm -hmm. did happen, um, and they will be there. But um, with this one specifically, um, you know, we saw national news there. We saw, uh, of course, local news. Mm -hmm. We saw some other news stations from other parts of the state uh, who were there, and you know, it's it's something that has to be covered. Mm -hmm. Someone, it, it's it's the same reason why. We were sending me to a hurricane. <laughs> right, <laughs> like the right. Past few nights. It's a dirty job, but someone has to mm -hmm. do it. And if you're going to do it, you may as well do it well. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, we we did work, and it's not just me; it's everyone here at Garagey. Right. Uh, we all uh, kind of had some sort of some sort of dealing in this. Mm -hmm. Well, you did a very thorough job reporting a really difficult story, and there were family members of. Derek Dearman that watched her coverage, that are listening to us right now, who may have had questions about what happened. And that's why we wanted to join you live this afternoon to close that chapter, like, mm -hmm. like Asher said, and a story that we've covered for the last eight years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will say, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's so easy when we report a story to say, oh, this person's on death row, they're a bad person. This person's on death row, you know, this and that. Mm -hmm. We, while behind the cameras, we um, we definitely, like I said, we we have emotions. Mm -hmm. There are still there's still weight that's carried by talking to these people, talking talking to Derek Dearman on the phone. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something I'm I'm never gonna forget. Right, you know? right. So um, yeah, I mean, there's there, there's a lot of people who are curious about it. Um, even like I said, even going through the neighborhood, not just at Holman, but even going through the neighborhood that this happened and not knowing where that house was mm -hmm. was creepy. I'm sure it was. That was really creepy, yes, but. I'm sure. All right, well, we are going to uh, go ahead and sign off now because I've got to anchor the WKRG News 5 at 5. If you have any other questions for Asher, you know where to find him, WKRG Asher Red on Facebook, and or shoot him an email, email at red at wkrg.com. He can answer your questions. Anything else you want to add, Asher? I think we touched think up on everything. Yeah. I just... Just know that we, I mean, with with these stories, it does take a somewhat of an emotional toll. Mm -hmm. But um, we, we everyone here at KRG did did great with it, though. Yeah. Not just me. All right, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for Death Row Confidential. I'm Devin Walsh along with Asher Red. Have a great afternoon, everybody, and I'll see you in about uh, 19 minutes on WKRG News Five at five.